A few definitions of negotiation. Let's start our journey with a new definition of what negotiation is. First, don't write. There is no difference between negotiation, persuasion, communication, or selling. They all should have the same process. That is, they should start with goals, focus on people, and be situational. Let's dispense with negotiating phrases such as making a series of mutual concessions or finding a positive settlement range. And it's not true that people are either cooperative or competitive. How they behave often depends on the situation. People and situation don't fit into neat little boxes. Instead, let's define negotiation in ways that will help you organize what you actually need to do and give you a better window into the process. This definition of negotiation has four levels, beginning with the most superficial. Negotiation is the process of forcing people to do what you will them to do. This involves threats, violence, take it or leave it demands, the use of raw power. Of course, this is negotiation. You've persuaded people that un unless they do it your way, at least for the time being, you did them black and blue. And sometimes it works. Battles and wars have been won. Aggression has sometimes carried the day. The main problem with force is not that it doesn't work. With 20 trillion dollars, the United States can probably do whatever it wants in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. With virtually unlimited resources, the United States could probably do whatever it wanted in Afghanistan or anywhere else. The problem is that force is very expensive, it should not be enforcing, and as such, takes a long time, if not forever, for continued compliance. So the question to ask include, is force the best use of my resources? Is this the easiest way to meet our goals of time? For example, if you use violence and don't wipe out the other side, they will probably keep fighting. If you threaten them, they will find a way to get back as you. Mostly, you've persuaded them not to fight back today. In a limited, specific situation, raw power might be justified. But to watch TV or the movies or listen to many leaders, you'd think it is the human behavior 
of a choice. In fact, it is the most suboptimal choice. Overall, it's not as profitable or effective as other choices. Look how expensive it is to find someone in court. To getting people to think what you want them to think. The second level is better. Getting people to see the rational benefit in your idea. This is what has been called interest-based negotiation and popularized in many negotiation books. However, it depends on people being rational. But in the real world, it usually doesn't carry the day by itself. Most important negotiations have a big emotional component. There is often a lot of irrational behavior. The more important the negotiation is to the other party, the less interest-based negotiation works. A family color of where to go on vacation, or workplace argument of who gets what office is hard to settle with interest-based negotiation alone. It's not enough to focus on what rational or reasonable people think might work well. And that brings us to what is really effective in negotiation, persuasion, and communication. This is where your real success in dealing with others begin. Getting people to perceive what you want them to perceive. Now you are looking at the world the way the other side does. And you are thinking of ways to change their perception. You are starting with a picture in their heads. This is the right place to begin in order to persuade them. This perception often from communication failures cause conflict and negotiation breakdown everywhere, every day. Understanding others' perception is essential to successful negotiation. You then change their perception incrementally. It will actually make the negotiation shorter, more self-enforcing, and easier. Getting people to feel what you want them to feel. This approach is totally self-enforcing. You are tapping into their emotion, their irrationality, if you will. Almost every views, almost everyone views the world through their own feelings and perceptions. The pressure is on when the stakes are high, the feelings usually take over. Whether evident or not, a negotiation that considers feeling is much broader than interest. And it includes all these, the entire menu of what people want. From the reasonable to the crazy. 
when the other party realizes you care about their feelings, they will listen more, making them more harsh and double. In my experience, few people acknowledge or use this in negotiations. Imagine opposing attorneys or sports owners with striking players or the United States with Iran say, before we sit down to formally talk about the issues, how do you guys feel? Are you happy? What is your favorite food? How's your family? And yet, this is what is required to get the best result. Throughout this book, you will see that people who this, this negotiated better and got more. All of this material, strategies, tools, models, attitude, taken together is a negotiation process. It is a way of talking to others, a way of conducting yourself, a way that will help you get better results. Through a separate skill, it is intended to become part of you. Effective negotiation becomes as natural as talking. It is not something done at a table or in a former setting. It is your life. The fact will change from situation to situation, but the process should not. Doing this well will enable you to negotiate anything with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Near the beginning of my courses, I ask students who negotiated something today. It doesn't matter what the negotiation is about, a hot dog or a hot job. Each event can be broken down and deconstructed into each essential element in the same way. These elements can then be examined, learned, and put back together again so you can negotiate at a higher level. Think how much more effect you would be if you spent 10 or 15 minutes before negotiation going down the list and asking how each strategy applies in this instance? Did you find out enough about the other party? Are your goals clearly defined? Are you being incremental enough? Afterwards, we will assess how you did using the list. Perhaps change it a little and learning for uh, next time. This is called an inductive process, starting from each situation and then figuring out the exact strategies and tools that are likely to be most effective. It's also knowledge you can then bring with you to the next negotiation. You might, for example, find that standards worked well in one situation and an appeal to relationship worked in another and focusing on individual needs worked in a, in a third. Now, let's start going over the list so that I can persuade you to think differently. Goals. 
this is one of the big differences between the advice you're getting right and what you likely read elsewhere about negotiation. Goals are not just another negotiation tool to use. Goals are the be all and end all of negotiation. <clears throat> you negotiate to meet your goals. Everything else is subservient to that. The goals are what you are trying to accomplish. Don't try to establish a relationship unless it brings you closer to your goals. Don't deal with others' interests or needs or feelings or anything else unless it brings you closer to your goals. Don't give or get information unless it brings you closer to your goals. This is a really big point. People shouldn't negotiate to achieve win-win or to create a relationship or to get a yes. Unless it aligns with their goals, win-win is overused. It sounds vaguely manipulative. When people say to me, let's go for a win-win, I think so they want something from me. The point of negotiation is to get what you want. Why should you, you negotiate to create your relationship if it won't help you meet your goals? Why should you try for a win-win if others continue to try to halt your career? Maybe you actually want a lose-win outcome. You won't lose today, so they will give you more tomorrow. Maybe you want to lose lose, so you can both see how that feels. Maybe you want a win lose outcome. In order to train them to act differently next time. Don't get distracted and conclude it with other stuff. Being nice, being tough, being emotional, etc. Never take your eyes off the goal. It's what you want at the end of the process that you don't have now. Much has been written about meeting goals. Studies show the goal setting is one of the most important things someone can do for themselves. The mere act of setting a goal has been shown to increase performance by more than 25%. Well, what's invisible is not that no one knows they need to identify and meet their goals. What's invisible is that they don't do it. They don't do it because they don't focus on it. They don't do it because they get distracted. And then, if they finally start doing it, they don't complete it. They lose their way in the middle. Some executives dismiss this advice with a wave of the hand. We learn this stuff in business school. They say, then why don't they do it? It's important to execute things in a focused, ordered way. It's not enough to say, meet your goals. We need to know exactly how to do this. The first thing you need to do is decide 
what your goal is explicitly at the beginning and remind yourself of along the way what's your goal in going to the store knowing that in advance will stop you from wasting money on impulsive buy. What's your goal in discussing vacation plans with your family to prove who's right to punish them for something else or to decide on a vacation you can take that it will be nice for all of you. How many times have you gone to a meeting and said to the people there, what do you want at the end of this meeting and you don't have now? If you haven't done this before, try it. It's very effective. Although people will sometimes lie or refuse to say, but in large people will tell you and you will quickly find out whether everyone thinks they are at the same meeting with the same goal. Even a slight difference in goals can wind up as a mess in a negotiation. Write down your goals and remind yourself. Have friends and colleagues remind you. Not just at the beginning of the process, but all along the way. Not having a goal is a lie. Getting into the car without knowing where you are headed. And not checking your goal is a lie. Not checking the map along the way. People often get distracted in the middle of a meeting or a campaign. New information often emerges. Unless you check your goals at intervals, you are less likely to meet them. It doesn't matter how well you know the company or person. I knew an executive who was hired as vice president for a strategy at a leading U.S. firm just after she arrived, she wrote a note to the other 12 senior executives, inviting them to a meeting, asking them to bring their goals for the company. After receiving the note, the company's CEO called her up and said, Wait a minute, you just got the here. We've been working here for years. We know our goals for the company. Fair enough, the new vice president said, but you asked me to work on corporate strategy. I promise you that if you let the meeting happen, it will be worthwhile. And it won't take very long, the CEO said, okay. The other 12 senior executives came to the meeting with their goals for the company. The strategy vice president wrote them up on the board one by one. At the end, the 12 executives so that they actually had not one or two or 
3와 4 goals. They had 14 different goals, and most of these goals contradicted each other. Oh, they said. The more specific your goals, the better. I'd like to go to Chicago is better than I'd like to go to Illinois. A let's put a man on the moon is better than let's explore space. I want to graduate from college is not as good as I won't get at least BS while I'm writing a book. Too often, people think they can meet their goals on at the expense of others. You need to think about their goals as well as yours, or others will soon give you less. If you meet your goals today at the expense of the long term, you have served yourself poorly. Getting more means meeting your goals for all relevant people and periods. Once you have identified your goals, it is important to keep asking. Are my actions meeting my goals? The world is full of people who fail to do this. They get emotional, or distracted, or are just not thinking this way. It goes for you, and it goes for others you care about. Angela Arnold's father had a stroke. He wanted to leave the hospital before his rehab was complete. Angela, now a consultant, asked her father what he was most looking forward to at home. Walking Ringo, his dog. Angela's father said, well, Angela said, If you want to walk Ringo and you leave the hospital now, you won't be able to walk Ringo. She said, If, she, if he finished rehab, he'll be able to walk on a, a seated upon discharge. Then he could walk Ringo. Angela showed her father that his proposal would not have met his goals. Her, fa her father finished rehab. Here's a new definition of competitiveness. Your ability to meet your goals. This phrase in the face of centuries of business thinking. Even today, the philosophy of Scottish economist Adam Smith is predominant. Smith, widely cited as the father of modern economics, saw competitiveness as next much self interest. It has been viewed since then as gaining power over opponents. Winner takes all, take no prisoners. Some later call it economic Darwinism. Today, the most competitive people are replacing this with the thinking of John Nash, a Princeton University mathematician who won the 1994 Nobel Prize 
and was popularized in the movie A Beautiful Mind. Nash proved mathematically the 1755 theory of a Swiss philosopher John Jack Hughes Russell Russell that when parties collaborate the oversize of the pie almost always expands so each party gets more than it could get alone. The typical example is that four hunters can each catch only one rabbit while acting alone, but they can catch a deer together. Today, smart competitors collaborate whenever they can. Consider the powerful computer created among IBM, Apple, and Motorola. What strategic alliances for research or marketing among pharmaceutical firms Research shows that almost 90% of the time, people in cooperative environments perform better than people in traditional, competitive, win lose environment. In other words, performance contests in general don't enhance performance. You might say skeptically that some parts can be expanded and that if one party wins, the other party lose, loses. If I ask for an example, the number one answer people give is let. To which I reply, fine, if land is important to you, you take Congo, I'll take Japan. In other words, not all land is equal. There are lots of ways to compete. Don't get a lot in to one dimension. Okay, write, write your goals down. Check them often. <clears throat> you, your attitude, credibility, transparency. The attitude you bring to a negotiation has a direct impact on the result you get. If you come to a negotiation expecting a war, you get one. And you will get less. Studies show that adversarial negotiators make about half as many deals as do more cooperative problem solving negotiators. As they get about half as much from the deals they do make. So if you are confrontational, expect about 25% of what's possible. If you are in a large mood, it's not the right time to negotiate. If, if you are the company expert, you may not be the right person to negotiate if you can't connect with the other party. This does not mean you should try to become, to 
to be someone else. Most people are bad at acting. People will detect it and you will lose your credibility. The most important asset you have in any in an human interaction is your credibility. If people don't believe you, it's hard to convince them of anything. Your credibility is more important than your expertise, connection, intelligence, asset, and looks. Instead, you should use getting more to learn how to be yourself better. There is no special way to talk. The strategies and tools in this book should become part of you, whoever you are. People appreciate it when others are straight with them, no matter what straight is. This should lift the burden of having to be someone you are not. This means if you are very aggressive, warn people in the beginning. If I get too aggressive, let me know. What does this do? First, it takes away the issue by setting expectations. Second, it makes you more real. It increases your credibility. Third, it eliminates the need for you to do any sort of dance to act in a way that is unnatural to you. And now you can focus on meeting your goals. And if you are overly accommodating, let people know that you often give away too much and have to backtrack later. So they need to tell you if the deal is getting unfair. You give them the responsibility and give yourself an out if they try to take advantage of your generosity. Then you can be yourself. <clears throat> When I go to another country and don't know the culture way, I often apologize in advance. I will tell the other person I might accidentally say something inappropriate. I wish I knew your culture better. Every time I make a mistake, could you please advise me? I will now turn every instance of, of potential conflict into an instance of collaboration in which they are my advisors. And I have taken away the tension from cultural mistakes. I can be myself. Great negotiators have a firm grasp of the obvious. If you're not getting along in a negotiation with the other party, you should say, I don't think we are getting along here. Why not? You might as well say it. The other party is thinking it. It's like on a hundred pound gorilla in the room. It will prevent getting a decent agreement. 
If you are in a bad mood, tap the other side. I'm in a bad mood. It'll cause them to forgive us something they might not otherwise. Transparency also means you should share these tools with the other side. The more people who know of these tools, the better the negotiation will be. Because this is not about getting the better of someone. This is about getting more. So give the list to your spouse, your kids, your friends, and your business associates. This is counterintuitive to most people. Most negotiators think they should be anything but transparent. However, the result is a lack of trust. This doesn't mean you have disclosed everything. Uh, it does mean you should disclose as much as you can to meet your goals and make the other side comfortable. For the rest, you can say, I'm not comfortable telling you this yet. Effective negotiators are never satisfied with anything. Their performance, result, process. This doesn't mean they are unhappy. It doesn't mean they are unsuccessful. It just means they continually try to figure out if they can get more. Even as you are celebrating a successful deal, you should be saying to yourself, was the relationship as good as it could have been? Did we do any cross-selling? Could we have done it faster or better? This is what pushes good negotiator to get even better. My best students want to be criticized. They know that each mistake makes them stronger once they understand it. They are not likely to make that mistake again. I'm always asking for criticism. You should too. Small steps in our imaginations. Big, bold moves produce big successes. In the real world, big, bold moves mostly scare people away. You are trying to go too far, too fast. Small, incremental steps accomplish more. This is especially true if two parties are far apart in a negotiation. Incremental step, steps give other people a chance to catch their breath. Look around, decide if the steps if, take, if taken feel good, and then move on with confidence. Incremental steps anchor people to the steps or steps they have already accepted. 
they reduce the perceived risk of moving forward. An analogy, if you are a point to any heater in baseball and you get one extra hit every nine games, you become a point three ten heater in baseball. And that is worth a spot in the baseball hall of fame and ten trillion dollars more a year in compensation. Or for one extra hit every thirty six every thirty six time at bat. I'm not trying to hit home run in negotiations. I'm trying to get one extra hit every nine games. It's a good lesson for negotiation and a good lesson for life. A few incremental improvements and you will be fabulously more successful. But let's not carry the sports analogy too far. In sports, the goal is for each side to win. Life is not a sports game. In sports, it is expected that one side will lose. There is a finite game, tournament, or season. In life, there is a tomorrow and it is expected at least normally for people to all get something. Even so, don't be greedy. It turns people off and causes them to distrust you and give you less. When you try to get a little more, you fall below most people's radar screens. Your proposal is digestible. You can always ask for more the next time. I tell my students every ceiling is a new floor. John Carson, the legendary European as AS airline executive once said, the difference between success and failure is two millimeters. In other words, it's something as seemingly insignificant as a ton of praise, a look, a small gesture, the tools that work are very small, subtle, and yet very effective. The title of this book is Getting More, not Getting Everything. No negotiation tools and strategies work all the time. But they work more often than if you don't use them. This is not intended to make you perfect. It is intended to make you better every day. Start with each things in a negotiation and scale up from there. If you can increase your success by even a few percent in your negotiation with others, you will be fabulously more successful. Anyone who tells you that this or that 
strategy always works is blowing smoke at you. Okay, what we are looking for is that one extra hit every night game. Before this course, my tactics worked about 50% of the time. I thought I was pretty good negotiator, said Gerald Singleton, a former student of mine at USC. Now I use better tools and they work 75% of the time. For me, that's much better and I have a framework to keep improving throughout my life. Everything is situational. Here is my entire negotiation course. In three broad questions. One, what are my goals? Two, who are they? Three, what will it take to persuade them? Every negotiation, every situation is different. That's because there are different people in the negotiation. Who are the same people on different days? Who are different set of facts and circumstances? Who are a different goals? So, I need to ask this question for every situation. The third question depends on the answer to the first two. And this is why you need the list. You choose from the list and from the various support individual tools based on goals and people. You may act differently in two negotiations on the same subject with the same fact. That's because either the goals or the people who are both are different. There is no one size fits all. If anyone says to you, here's how you negotiate real estate deals, be skeptical. They may know various real estate tactics that work sometimes or sort of. They may have real estate expertise, but until you define your goals and the people involved in that particular situation, you can effectively decide what negotiation tools to news. The people involved in a negotiation and the process they use comprise more than 90% of what is important in a negotiation. The substance, the facts, and the expertise make up less than 10%. This is quite counterintuitive for most people.